Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Cousin Jonathan and Quiet the Rocket Man Big Book Study. We're just two sober alcoholics reading, studying, and discussing the big book the way Joe and Charlie did back in the day. So let's start with a moment of silence followed by the set-aside prayer. God, please enable us to set aside everything we think we know about ourselves, the 12 steps, the big book, the meetings, alcoholism, and you, God, so that we may have an open mind and a new experience with all of these things. Please let us see the truth. So we're going to ask God to help us just remember we are clean slates right now. We don't know what a big book is. We don't know what alcoholism is. We're just completely blank slates ready to be taught and learn. So here we go. We're going to continue now. Um, give you some background on, you know, what's behind this. In 1973, Joe McHugh introduced Charlie P. as the AA speaker at an Al-Anon convention. And Joe and Charlie soon discovered they both shared a love for the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So traveling between their homes to discuss the big book became a regular event. And that's what launched those guys. So turns out that cousin Jonathan and I met here in the zoo crew about a year and a half ago. And we both discovered that we absolutely love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And that is uh, the genesis of this podcast. Cousin Jonathan and I working together, studying the book. So, and thank you for being here. We're so glad. We meet every Sunday from two o'clock to 3.30 p.m. Eastern in this room. So please have your big book handy to read along with us, take notes, and also to underline and highlight as we read. So we do record the meeting. It's being recorded now, and uh, you can share it with others also on our podcast. Uh, if you go to our webpage, and uh, it's on there. Okay, so the purpose of the big book study meeting is to help you when meeting with a prospect, which is now called a sponsee, or talking about sobriety in general, because you want to be armed with the facts about yourself in the AA program. Freedom from alcohol comes through taking the 12 steps and working with others. Page 15 of the 12 and 12 says AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. How soon do you want to be happy, joyous, and free? Yeah, now, Sorry. right? <laughs> Sorry. Why, why wait? So we suggest that you purchase a copy of the big book for future use. You'll want to underline, highlight, and write notes. Please order your AA literature directly from AA so that the money goes to Alcoholics Anonymous and to ensure that you get a good copy. We are not advocating rushing through the steps. We highly suggest that you have a sense of urgency in taking the 12 steps and having them become a way of life sooner than later. Pretend this is a matter of life and death. Actually, it is a matter of life and death. Once again, how soon do you want to be happy, joyous, and free? You can go to our website at thezoocrew.org to order your copy of the big book as well as read it online. The big book is our basic text and contains the full recipe for recovery. It's impossible to find a loophole in the big book that excludes you from being a member of AA. Okay, so we're going to start the study now. And uh, right now, I want to, before we begin, just want to do a, a recap of where we're at specifically in the book. Uh, we're in chapter three, more about alcoholism. And I just want to read some of the key quotes to you that we've already studied and read about. Uh, beginning, this chapter starts on page 30, and it continues to page 43. Uh, we're going to be picking up on page 41, so we're getting toward the end of it. But here's what this chapter is all about. In the first paragraph, 
it says, uh, the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. So that is really important to remember that, that how badly we wish we could control and enjoy our drinking. I mean, think about your perfect drinking scenario where you get that perfect level of intoxication, whether you like to be lightly buzzed or really drunk or in between, doesn't matter. Just think about yourself you know, getting to that point and then just maintaining that, being able to control that, you know, that is the thinking that's going on in our head. It's like, man, I wish I could just get that perfect level of intoxication and control it and drink a little more, a little less and just manage it. And boy, wouldn't that be awesome? That's the thinking. Okay. <laughs> and, and it turns out that that's insanity. Okay. So it's a delusion, it's an illusion, it's an obsession, and it's insanity. By the way, I'm going to post in the chat right now uh, that what it means, sane, sanity and insanity are really easy to comprehend. Sane means reasonable, okay? Insane means foolish or unreasonable, okay? So that's the simple way to, to think of sanity and insanity. Because you know, remember, we took the second step where we uh, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Sanity means just reasonableness, being able to make reasonable decisions. That's all that means. And um, insanity means we're, we make foolish, unreasonable decisions. And that's what we do because we have alcoholic minds. Okay, so that was that one. On page 31... It talks about, um, we don't want to believe that we're alcoholics. It says in the first complete paragraph, it says, by every form of self-deception and experimentation, try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. Again, here's that obsession to control and enjoy. So I, I'm using self-deception and experimentation now to prove that I'm not an alcoholic. And bottom line is, <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. This doesn't work. So then on page 32, uh, this is where we were uh, learned, read about the first example in this chapter was this man of 30 years old that was able to quit drinking for 25 years on his own willpower. So what happened to him, though, after that 25 years in the uh, toward the bottom of the page, it says then. So after 25 years, he thought. He fell victim to a belief, which practically every alcoholic has, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. In other words, he thought he could control it. Obviously, he, he didn't have a drink for 25 years. He's got this under control, right? Well, two months, he was in the hospital, and within four years, he was dead. So the point is, we don't regain control, okay? Um, then on page 34, these are the key concepts about, you know, this chapter that we're reading. It says that, uh, refers to it toward the bottom of the page, the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. And here it is, this utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. So even though I really, really, really want to quit drinking and I have to, or it's going to kill me, I, I, I have an utter inability to stop. That is the craziness. That's the insanity of alcoholism. And then on page 38, there's another key concept. It talks about, uh, let's see. Oh, page 38 sounds ridiculous. Oh, yeah. So we learned about the example of the jaywalker. Here's another example that we read about. And, and this guy uh, walks in front of cars because he gets a thrill out of it. And he keeps getting hit and getting hurt. And uh, he realizes, oh, my gosh, I get, you know, this has to stop. I'm going to quit doing this. But he's so addicted to the thrill, he just can't stop. And so he keeps walking in front of cars and getting hit and hurt. And it says, uh, you may think our illustration is too ridiculous, 
because it does sound ridiculous. It'd be stupid enough to just keep racing in front of cars and getting hit. And, but it says, but is it? And it says, if we substituted, we have to admit, if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. Okay. So it is ridiculous, but it does match us exactly. Okay. And we want to stop, but we can't. Okay. And then finally, on uh, page 41 and 42, we're learning about this guy. Oh, by the way, uh, well, we'll get to that. Um, we're talking about the alcoholic mind here. At the bottom of page 41, it talks about how they prophesied that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. And then down below, uh, toward the middle of that paragraph at the top of page 42, says, I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. So remember, we read in the chapter two, there is a solution that the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. And, and so that's what this is all about, these four examples. So we had the carpet slipper guy who thought he could control it after his abstinence of 25 years. He was wrong. Jim the uh, car salesman that tried putting whiskey in his milk thought he could enjoy his drinking if he would just get be smart about it and drink on a full stomach with some sandwiches and milk in his stomach mix the whiskey with milk so it's watered down a little bit and then he could just ingest a little bit and it'd be good that would work right well that didn't work and then the jaywalker, we talked about him. He had this utter inability to stop, even though there was a great necessity and wish. And now we're on the example of Fred. Okay. So this Fred guy uh, has got it all put together as far as being a successful businessman, plenty of money, great career, great house, great family, everything going for him. The only problem is he's an alcoholic and he can't stop drinking. And it's causing a lot of problems for the guy. So well, here we go. We're going to pick up on page. I'm going to read the first paragraph and then we're going to pick up on the new part. So here's what happened. This is, I'm going to set the stage for where we're at on page 40 at the bottom of the page. It says, in this frame of mind, I went about my business and for a time all was well. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard work of a simple matter. So now Fred's feeling confident that I don't know why I was so worried about drinking. This is no big deal. I got this under control. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. I'd been out of town before during this particular dry spell, so there was nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. So he's had just a fantastic day, a great business outing. He's on the road. He's feeling good, not even thinking about drinking. Everything's great, right? Not a cloud on the horizon. So Loretta Mama Bear, you want to come in and share with us? Come on in. And yes, uh, uh, I want to mention that if you'd like to share, please raise your hand and then I'll call on you so we don't end up talking over the top of each other. So come on in and share with us. Ma Oops, I, I accidentally muted you. It's okay. I love you guys. Loretta Mama Bear and I'm definitely an alcoholic. But yeah, I, that, that simple matter. Uh, in a paragraph it's just read, and, and that frame of mind is that I didn't real when I God delivered me from alcohol one day, I, and I didn't realize I was an alcoholic. I didn't drink, and you know, and then so, something drastically happened to me, and I and th this is what it reminded me of is that I didn't realize I was an alcoholic. So I said, okay, well, two beers won't hurt. 30 years later, here I am. So that uh, that uh that's when I realized in the middle of the 30 years, I realized I was an alcoholic. So I just wanted to share that with you all. But um, yeah, I was sober for two years. I didn't realize I was an alcoholic. I thought it was fine. Two year, uh, 
30 years later after two beers, forget about it. Thank you very much for letting me share. Have a beautiful Great. Thanks for sharing with us, Mama Bear. We're glad you're here studying the book with us. Thank you. Okay, so um, who'd like to read for us? We're going to read the next paragraph. We read the, the book one paragraph at a time, and then we're going to stop and have a discussion and study and compare our experiences and, and really dig into what Bill's saying here and what the story, what we're learning here. So if someone wants to volunteer to read, that would be terrific. From page 41, I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed. Judy. Oh, great. Great. Okay, so Suzanne, yeah, you go ahead and read that first paragraph for us, Suzanne. Okay, Wait. we're ending on page 41 there at the end on the horizon. So I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That, all, that was all, nothing more. I ordered a cocktail and my meal. Then I ordered another cocktail. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed. So I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty next morning. I have, I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane being bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days and I know little of what I went, little of where I went or what I had said and did. Then came the hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. Okay, let's, let's stop right there and, and, and talk about what we just read. So uh, first of all, when when we see italics, that means uh, to really, a uh, bill's trying to stress a point. Uh, and that means special emphasis, and, and we should really pay attention to that. And so here's what it said. Uh, as I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. So he wasn't making up this insanely trivial excuse, using self-deception and experimentation and figuring out some sneaky way to get away with it. He, he wasn't thinking at all. He, he said he just came to his mind. It's like, hey, boy, it sure be nice to have a cocktail. And, and that was it. Nothing more. So he ordered a cocktail and, and had his dinner. So is that crazy or is that crazy? He didn't even think about it. It just happened. And we're going to find out why as we continue reading. So um, has anyone here uh, do you have any experience with just deciding that, hey, it's a great idea, even though you know now, and I mean after you've been sober for a while, not back when you were getting loaded all the time, but in your sobriety, have, have you just had an idea at some point, like anybody here that's relapsed that just all of a sudden found a drink in their hand because they thought, hey, I'm going to have a drink, you know, without really doing any self-deception or experimentation. Come on in, Loretta, Mama Bear. Whoops, I think I muted you. Darn it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. As I said previously, um, I didn't, when that was my relapse, I didn't think twice as I was an alcoholic, but that's when after I, I took those two beers. After that, I don't remember. Uh, 30 years later, here I am. So, um, but I can I definitely identify not thinking about it, any more of it, and ordering the cocktail, and then moving along. Thank you very much for letting me share. Okay, thank you. And since this is a literature-based, you know, study, I think we'll just go with the 90 second shares like we have at our other big book studies and so forth. So uh, come on in and share with us, Wendy. Uh, yes, I can definitely relate to this. Um, I had several periods of sobriety before I found AA and started really, you know, going through the steps and working the program. 
Um, and, you know, I was okay after a couple of drinks, but then within a, a short period of time, it just led to the chaos again. So, um, yep, that, that, that's me. Okay, good. So that, yeah, that's what we're here for to compare, see how our experience matches up with the text. And that's the beauty of the big book. If you, if they're telling our story in here, then we can see all the problems and identify and relate to it with the way it applies to us. And then they have the solution in here. Then they're just showing us, Hey, you know, here's the problems that match with me. So I'm going to follow their suggestions for the solution because it worked for them. It'll work for me. That's the beauty of the program. Come on in, Suzanne. Hi everybody. I'm Suzanne. Again, I'm an alcoholic, still an alcoholic. Um, exact same thing happened to me. There was a time in my life where I had stopped drinking for nine years. I didn't have a drink. I went to AA and I realized now I wasn't actually working the program. I just went to meetings and I attended meetings and I stayed sober for nine years. And then I went on a business trip. It was a cruise and went out and I thought, oh, well, you know what? It's just the weekend. It's a you know quick trip business. Everybody's having a fun trip with the salespeople. I, one drink won't hurt. So I had a glass of wine and then I had another and another. And 30 years later, I'm here. So the exact same story it did. I, I didn't stop with the glass of wine. It continued. It was, at first, it was just a glass. And then the next day, it was another two glasses. And then when I got back home, it was, ah, I can do this. And it just took off. And I never stopped. And then it ended up being every hour. So it, same thing to me. Same thing happened to me. Wow. Okay. That's terrific. See, that's what I'm talking about. Um, exact same experience as what happened to Fred, our friend Fred. Oh, man. Uh, glad you made it back, Suzanne. Come on in, Lindsay, and share with us. Good afternoon, Lindsay. Grateful recovery alcoholic. Um, actually, a similar thing happened to me. Um, I had stopped for a while, and then it was like, oh, everything's brand new. Everything's fresh again, you know, and I had one, and you know what? After that one, it was all downhill from there. It's like, okay, well, I'm just going to have this one or that one. And it was just like, it just kept piling and spiraled very, very fast. Like there was no controlling anything, right? So that just goes to show that once after the first one, it's, it's toast. Then, thanks. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, so uh, Suzanne, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and continue and see you know, the more of the story here. Fred's going to tell us about it. So go ahead and read the next paragraph, Suzanne, please. Okay, all right. So as soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatsoever against the first drink. This time I was not, I had, this time I had not thought of the consequences at all. I had commenced to drink as carelessly and at um, and as though the cocktails were ginger ale. I now remembered what my alcoholic friends had told me, how they pro prophesied that if I, had an if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and the place would come, I would drink again. They had said that, though I did raise my defense, it would, not, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well, just that did happen and more for what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. I knew from the moment that I had an alcoholic mind. I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had, <clears throat> I had never been able to understand people who said that a problem had them hopelessly defeated. I knew then it was crushing, it was a crushing blow. Yes. Okay. So let's stop there and discuss this oh paragraph. There's a lot here. So, yeah, I'm going to. Glasses there. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to mute everyone here. Okay. Good. All right. Judy, um, come on in and share. What do you think about what we just, Suzanne just read for us? It had me in mind when they wrote this paragraph. Um, some of the women here know that I relapsed this week. I have uh, never had a, a, a sober period or, uh, yeah, I've never had a sober period. Um, 
and I was and I was feeling uh, this week. I was I was feeling good. I got through a situation on Monday that normally would have stressed me. It actually did stress me so much that I had to do a meditation on the way up to where I was going. Um, so I I was good, you know, on Tuesday or or whatever you know day it was, and and I was like, okay, I got this, and apparently I didn't because. When I drank on Wednesday or whatever day it was that I drank, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well, just that did happen and more. For what I learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. And that was Judy. That was Judy this week. And, and it was in my head and you know, okay, I haven't learned a lot about alcoholism, but you know what? It didn't occur to me at all. And I, and I, and I, you know, I beat myself up over it and everything, but I, I have an alcoholic mind and that's, okay. that's my issue. Okay. Thanks for sharing with us, Judy. Yeah. It sounds like your story matches that story pretty darn good. Um, so yeah, we just want to go back to the italics again says, not only had I been off guard, I made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all. So the carpet slipper guy was the first example, and he wasn't anticipating any consequences. He thought he could control his drinking because he hadn't drank for 25 years, so like no problem. But the next guy, Jim, you know, he, he knew he had a serious problem and he had to quit. And he couldn't quit. And by the way, the carpet slipper guy did realize that he needed to quit, uh, but he could not. Okay. And so Jim knew there were going to be bad consequences, but he drank anyway. He thought about it. The jaywalker keeps getting hit, knows there's consequences. He needs to quit. He can't stop. This guy didn't think of the consequences at all. They didn't even occur to him. So Fred just decided, hey, this is going to be great. I'll have a drink. So they probably, but his friends warned him that he has, if he has an alcoholic mind, which obviously he does, the time and place would come that he would drink. And that's exactly what happened to him. And that's what he says. Just that did happen. And then he does. He now he knows he has an alcoholic mind. Willpower, self knowledge won't work. So they're just repeating that point we learned earlier in the chapter, self-knowledge, self-knowledge, self-knowledge. Bill talks about it in his story. And uh, we learned about it in the chapter, more about Al this chapter and also, uh, well, mainly this chapter, it doesn't work. So does anyone else want to share on what we read or should we continue on? Okay, so Suzanne, why don't you go ahead and read the okay. next paragraph for us? I'll grab my glasses this time. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, two of the members of Alcoholic Anonymous came to see me. They grinned, which I didn't like so much, and then asked me if I thought myself alcoholic and if I were really licked this time. I had to concede both propositions. They piled on me heaps of evidence to the effect that an alcoholic mentality such as I had exhibited in Washington, was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozen. This process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. Okay, stop right there. And he just took a step, one of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Anybody know what step that might be? <laughs> Yeah, come on in, uh, Mama Bear. Okay. Um, yeah, I could definitely identify with that. Um, taking that first step, realizing it, it, it took me, after attempts of trying to stop again, after that first stopping for two years, I thought I could be able to whip it. And uh, I tried cutting, I did everything. I, I tried cutting back, I tried doing this, I tried doing that. None of that worked. And finally about 
just about two years ago, I said, God, I can't, why can't I quit? And that was the turning point. Um, he lifted my desire for alcohol again. And then six months after being sober, then I, he brought me into these uh, groups and, uh, and the fellowship kept me sober. Before then, I, I didn't want to really, I didn't like calling myself an alcoholic because I didn't like calling myself names. But uh, the way I feel about it now is that I'd rather call myself an alcoholic than to say that I have cancer. Um, there is recovery in being an alcoholic, but cancer of uh, uh, survival is very slim. Thank you very much for letting me share. Thank you, Mama Bear. Yeah, I just want to point out some key. This is all about step one, this whole paragraph. And it talks about, so remember, step one is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. So he admits that he's powerless over alcohol when they asked him if he was licked. And he said, myself, uh, he can, thought himself alcoholic and uh, was he really licked? And the answer was yes. And then the hopeless condition, it talks about snuffing out the last flicker of conviction. I could do the job myself and hopelessness. He, that's his unmanageability. So he's powerless over alcohol, unmanageable. And then it talks about concede. I had to concede on both propositions. And remember on page 30, at the beginning of this chapter, it tells us, you know, the first step, step one on page 59 says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. So the description, that's the description of the step. The actual instructions for taking the step are in the book. That applies to all the steps, by the way. And this step one is chapter three on page 30. It says, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. So that's the first step. So he finally took the first step. He's conceded to his innermost self, he's alcoholic, the powerlessness, the unmanageability, done. So, okay, and here's the good news. They're gonna give him a suggestion on what the second step is. Let's read about that next. Uh, okay, go ahead, that's, Suzanne. Yeah. That's good stuff, good stuff, acceptance and surrender. Okay, then they outlined the spiritual answer and program of action, which a hundred of them had followed successfully. Though I had been only a nominal churchman, their proposals were not intellectually hard to swallow. But the program of action, though entirely sensible, was pretty drastic. It meant I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out the window. That was not easy. But the moment I made up my mind to go through with the process, I had the curious feeling that my alcoholic condition was relieved, as in fact, it proved to be. Okay. Wow. There's a lot yeah. there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, let's go ahead and discuss that. So the spiritual answer, you know, is coming to believe that's step two. And then the program of action is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those are spelled out on page 59 are steps one through 11. Page 60 is step 12. And the instructions, the directions for taking those steps are contained throughout the book. Step one was on page 30. We're going to find out shortly uh, as we continue our study. You know, we're on page 42. Page 47 in chapter four, we agnostics is the directions for taking the second step. And then here's what he said. Once he decided to go through with the process, made up my mind to go through with the process. That's step three. That's the decision. And he had the curious feeling that his alcoholic condition was relieved. So that was when his obsession was taken away. Once he agreed, admitted his powerlessness, accepted a power greater than himself, and made a decision to turn his will and his life over to that power, his uh, obsession to drink, his alcoholic condition was relieved. So that's a beautiful start. <laughs> and then he continued with the rest of the process. This is so key. 
I, it meant I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out of the window. That is exactly what the next chapter is all about. We agnostics is the chapter about open-mindedness. It, it gets repeated over and over and over, getting rid of old ideas and trying a new way, thinking differently, taking different actions and thinking differently. And so that's what that means, having an open mind. That's why we said the set-aside prayer before we started this study. Come on in and share with us, Mama Bear. Thank you, Clyde. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It meant I would have to throw out several lifelong concepts. And that was one of that that was part of my recovery because during my course of drinking, I thought if I just loved people the way God loves people, I'll be okay. Because God loves me just the way I am. Because I couldn't stop drinking. So I had to accept the fact that I'm a drunk. But uh he had better plans because people don't like drunks. Um, they, they tend to shun you, push you aside, and don't pay attention to anything you say. You can tell them that God loves you all, all you want, or Jesus loves you all you want, but they're not going to listen to a drunk. So that's throwing out my lifelong concepts, is uh, letting go and let God deal with me as a sober person through these groups and through the recovery uh, journey that I've been treading on since uh, 23. Thank you very much for letting me share. Peace out. Thank you, Mama Bear. And uh, so there's another key thing in here. By the way, anyone that's new to the room, we're at the bottom of page 42 in chapter three, more about alcoholism. And uh, in the beginning, it says they out, they, then they outlined the spiritual answer and program of action, which a hundred of them had followed successfully. So when Bill started writing the book, Bill got sober in December, 1934. Dr. Bob got sober in June, 1935. And Bill Dotson, number three, also got sober like a week or two after Dr. Bob. And so that was in 34 and in the middle of 1935. By the time Bill started writing the book in the summer of 1938, there were about 40 recovered alcoholics. And by the time the book was published in April of 1939, there were about 100, between 70 and 100, but they're referring to it as 100. So that's who they're referring to here. 100 people had recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And, and that's the program using this program of action that's going to be spelled out in this book for us. So uh, that's where we're at. Um, any other shares on, on that paragraph that we just read? There's a spiritual answer. And we read about it. There is a solution. Chapter two, that person, the psychic change, the personality change. And we read about it in the uh, spiritual experience in the back of the book. It's a profound alteration in our reaction to life. We think differently. We feel differently. We behave differently. That's what this spiritual experience is all about. And that's what these 12 steps do for us. That's the spiritual answer. So, oh, well, we're going to learn more about it right now. Suzanne, why don't you go ahead and continue reading for us? All right. Yeah. Quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. I have since been brought into a way of living infinitely more satisfying and I hope more useful than the life I'd lived before. My old manner of life was by no means a bad one, but I would not exchange its best moments for the worst I have now. I would not go back even if I could. Okay, so let's stop right there. You know, uh, this reminds me in chapter two, there is a solution. We learned about um, being rocketed into the fourth dimension, uh, you know, of which I had not even dreamed. Uh, and so not only is it, does it go beyond the fourth dimension, it goes infinitely. Uh, that's the awesome thing, you know, um this spiritual solution the spiritual principles that we use solve all of our problems that's the miracle of it and by the way when i think of spiritual principles 
what I'm really thinking of, if you've done our fourth and fifth step, I mean, our uh, four step inventory, like the format that we use and we use it out of the big book, uh, but we have a fourth column where we have our character defects and we have our fifth column, which is the assets we strive for with God's help. Those are the spiritual principles that I'm talking about. So things that are blocking me from God are, for example, anger and resentment. Okay. And the spiritual principles that I use that I want God to remove the anger and resentment, replace it with acceptance and forgiveness and love. Okay. And dishonesty blocks me from God. That's a defect of character. And, and the spiritual principle that I want to have that replaced with is honesty and faithfulness. Okay. And um, instead of being you know, selfish, selfishness is bad for me. That's violating uh, God's will for me. And, and the spiritual principle that I use instead of selfishness is unselfishness and helpfulness to others. These are the spiritual principles that produce this infinitely more satisfying way of life. It really works. <laughs> it's amazing. So uh, this is the uh, spiritual program of action. We take the actions the way they're outlined in this book, and we get these beautiful spiritual results. Okay, so uh, does anybody else want to share on what we've read so far? Are you clear on the four examples and, and the alcoholic thinking and and the solution we're in the into the solution now regina come on in and share with us hey 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 <laughs> regina i don't know who texted me somebody reminded me thank you i love you um about the meeting um you know looking over the pages uh, 42 and 43 i summarized some highlights for me for the uh, better understanding and um the fact that those self the self-knowledge and willpower couldn't have been my solution. You know, I couldn't do it in my own mind. You know, I, I really wanted to quit drinking, but I couldn't do it. And the knowledge that is wrong for me is not a good way. I couldn't do it, even though having that, that aspect of it. And then it talked about that's the kind of the alcoholic mentality, the way of thinking, I think Clyde is what it's saying. And then it comes to on page 42, um, that there is a solution and it's spiritual in nature. Um, and it only, it only can be derived by a power outside of myself or source greater than myself by God. And that um, it, dem it demands action. You know, I have to put forth some effort in it because it says a program of action. But then it talks about those ideas and things where, where it says lifelong conceptions my ideas, my perceptions of the way that I saw the world be and my own way of seeing things, I had to get rid of that, put that aside and allow for my understanding for to allow God to give me that new, that new vision. And then at the top of page 43, it talked about, I hope. And there on that page, I see faith that none of this action, none of these things could take place had I, that faith or that hope had not been there. And I think that that's um, step sec the second step, isn't it? That God could and would if he were saw. Yeah, yeah. And it starts, you know, that after that is the decision, you know. So I just was trying to sum up these pages, you know, earlier on reading this and hearing people say it, but when it takes heart in your own mind and your own being, that's when it becomes powerful. So thank you for having a study. Thank, thank you. you, Regina. Yeah, we appreciate you being here and sharing with us. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead then. Yeah, let's wrap it up. It looks like this is the last or, or the last two paragraphs there. Yeah, a couple, a couple more paragraphs. Okay. So we'll go ahead and read the next one about Fred's story. Sure. Yeah. All right. Fred's story speaks for itself. We hope it strikes home to thousands like him. He had felt only the first nip of the ringer. Most alcoholics have to be pretty badly mangled before they really commence to solve their, their problems. Many doctors and psychiatrists agree with our conclusions. 
One of these men, staff member of a world-renowned hospital, recently made this statement to some of us. What you say about the general hopelessness of the average alcoholic's plight is, in my opinion, correct. As, as, two, as, to two men, as to two of you men whose stories I have heard, there is no doubt in my mind that you are 100% hopeless, apart from divine help. Had you offered yourselves as patients at this hospital, I would have not taken you if I had been able to avoid it. People like you are too heartbreaking. Though not a religious person, I have profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. For most cases, there is virtually no other solution. Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. Wow. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah, thank you for reading that for us. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. So just want to point out a couple of things. It says one of the doctors and psychiatrists, one of these men, staff member of a world-renowned hospital. Which hospital? That's the town's hospital. And who's the doctor? Dr. Silkworth. Okay. And uh, he is agreeing, you know, the hopelessness of the average alcoholic is correct. We're desperate and hopeless. And it says, as to two of you men, he said, there's no doubt you are 100% hopeless apart from divine help. This is, we're getting, they're prepping us for step two. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. We cannot do it on our own. Self-knowledge won't work. Self-propulsion won't work. We can't fix our insane mind with our insane mind. Our broken mind can't fix itself. We have to have divine help. And it says uh, he's not a religious person, but so this is so key. That's what we're going to read next. The chapter we agnostics is all about having an open mind, especially as it relates to spiritual principles and religious concepts and whatnot. It says he's not a religious person, Dr. Silkworth, but he has profound respect for the spiritual approach. He said, for most cases, there is virtually no other solution. It is the solution that we, we have to have a higher power is what they're telling us here. And this can cause a problem for certain people that consider themselves atheist or agnostic. And that's why Bill wrote the next chapter, 14 pages, 44 through 58. We agnostics is all about having an open mind with regard to spiritual matters because it's critical to our recovery. And then the conclusion says once more, the alcoholic, uh, we have no effective mental defense. It, the, Main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. We read about that earlier, and they're just repeating it here. And uh, says, we can't provide that defense against that first strength on our own. He's telling us it must come from a higher power. Reiterating this over and over and over. Must have a higher power. And that's what the next chapter is all about. So does anybody want to, well, that's the conclusion of chapter three, more about alcoholism. You know, it started with those examples of those people, the four guys. Come on in and share with us, Judy. Hi. Um, a couple things uh, st st uh, stood out to me and, and rang in my mind with this um, paragraph. The... Um, 100% hopeless. Um, I guess my stepdaughter tried for uh, a long time to get my husband to um, leave me. And um, that's what she said. She, she said she's, she will never be. Um, not, she will, she will always be an alcoholic. She's, 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 even if she gets clean, she's going back. Um, and that, you know, that really 
uh, it first of all it hurts mm -hmm. um but second of all no effective mental defense against the first drink so you know and his defense must come from a higher power so spirituality is your meaning for purpose and and um in in life and and religion is you know a collective uh worshiping and in my mind so you know the thing for me is i've got to use my higher power and that's the spirituality part of it to effectively override this mental block that i have um not not to drink so that's i'm not sure if you guys followed that but in my mind it made sense okay good that's the important thing here thank you <laughs> okay so by the way uh, we can come in and share it since it's a uh, 90 second shares and um you can share more than once if you want to, um, but we do, when other people have their hands up, they're going to go next. So come on in. Whoops, I just muted you, darn. I'm sorry, Regina. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you, Clyde. You know, one thing that really stands out for me, I tell you, whew, it is so good to be here. The part at the top of page 43, where it says, I have since been brought into a way of living infinitely more satisfying and i look up infant infinite and it says limitless or endless in space so there's you go out there to your where do you go clyde <laughs> where you say you are <laughs> and it says impossible to measure or calculate so i have now since i have turned my will and my life over to the care of god i have now place, allow God to place me by his grace into a place where it is limitless. I mean, the possibilities are there. It is out of this world. Can you imagine being with the God for me is creator God who made you all the stars, the sky, the heaven, the earth, and all of this. And I'm putting when infinite infinitely it says a way of living infinitely more satisfying and oh my goodness okay i'm just gonna take that away and try and settle down here great thank you regina i love it and, and at the the beginning of that paragraph at the bottom of page 42 it says quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles that's what's producing this infinitely satisfying life. It's I've discovered uh, the power within me, my higher power. And that is what's making my life infinitely better. It's a miracle. I'm so grateful. I'm with you, Regina. I, Can I I'm, just say one more, one more thing? I'm sorry. Please Help do. Me. You know, um, I had, I had got this one t-shirt that says blessed beyond measure, right? And so I didn't really know what it meant. I just believed it. Blessed beyond measure. When someone say, how are you today? I said, blessed beyond measure. Um, and now when I look at this, in this book, it gives me, um, enlightens me to the depth of what that really means. My life is blessed beyond measure. There is no, I can't even describe it. That's how blessed living is for me now that I found this new way of living. And I am so grateful for it. Thanks, Clyde. Thank you for listening to me, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Regina. And again, just to tie in with what Regina and I are talking about here as we wrap up you know, what was written there, if we refer back to what we already studied in chapter two, there is a solution. It says the central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous, mm -hmm. infinitely. It's unbelievable. So, so grateful. So that's a wrap then on the first three chapters of the big book, which all have to do 
was step one and step two. Now there's one more chapter of the, so the powerlessness and unmanageability, you'll recall, we read the doctor's opinion, we read Bill's story, then uh, that was chapter one. And then chapter two was the, there is a solution, told us the spiritual solution, the spiritual awakening is the solution. And then chapter three was more about alcoholism, which told us all about the insanity, the unreasonable, foolish decisions we make in our you know, desire to figure out how to drink and experiment, and it doesn't work. So talks about the insanity of drinking. And so now we're going to read about um, we agnostics. This is the solution. This is step two. Open-mindedness on spiritual matters is what this is all about. Keep that in mind. Chapter three was all about insanity. And chapter four is all about restoring us to sanity. This is um, we agnostic. So let's go ahead and start reading this. Um, would someone else, uh, Suzanne, you're doing a terrific. In fact, you're our reader today. So you read for us, Suzanne. Are you please. sure? Okay. If anybody else wants to read, they certainly can. I don't mind continuing. Yeah. So if let's, anybody that would like to read, you can raise your hand. Yeah, let's, no, you go ahead and okay. read first. All right. Yeah, the first All paragraph right. chapter is four. chapter four, yeah. Yeah, we agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have, <clears throat> you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope that we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Okay, so what did we just read right <laughs> there? It says, if you want to stop and you can't, uh, you have little control, you're probably alcoholic. That's step one. Okay. Now they're telling us what step two is next. It says, if that be the case, if you've taken step one and you've acknowledged you're an alcoholic, you're suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. We read about that in chapter two. That's the solution that can restore us to sanity, a spiritual experience. So that's step one. And then he's telling us what step two is. Uh, what it's the spiritual experience is the solution. Hopefully. Oops, I thought I was muted. Okay. So um, is everybody clear on where we're at with the process here? Good, good. So uh, now we're acknowledging that, okay, I, I need to have a spiritual experience. I'm an alcoholic, but I don't know about this. I, I'm not a big fan of this spiritual thing. So that's what this chapter is written about. So if anyone wants to share, you can come in and share, or we'll have Suzanne continue reading the next paragraph for us. Okay. okay, go ahead. To one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible, but to continue as he is means disaster, especially if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Okay, it, yeah, okay. let's stop right there. Okay. I just want to share my experience with this because when I got sober, I bristled with antagonism at the thought and the word God. It used to really set me off. As a matter of fact, when I would read the big book with my sponsor, I told him I want to substitute the word AA program of recovery, every time the word God, when we were reading, if I, I, I wouldn't even say that word, I would say AA program of recovery. So that's what they're talking about here. He was specifically talking about me in this, in this paragraph, because I was an atheist. I was an agnostic. I was atheist. I was convinced that this God thing was nonsense. And so then that makes me feel like, well, wait a minute, you're telling me a spiritual experience? That made me think of religion and the God of organized religion. And I thought, oh, man. So 
either I'm going to be doomed to an alcoholic death because I can't quit on my own, or I'm going to have to get on board with this God thing. Not an easy alternative to face. So and that's they were talking about me specifically. Does anybody else here? Did you have a problem with the God thing? Or do you currently have a problem with the God thing? Come on in, Judy, and share with us. Uh, to Clyde, this could not be you because this paragraph is me. Um, and the thing is that uh, to continue means disaster. And the other paragraph, uh, the other um, line, an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. I'm really sure if there are alcoholics of the um, hopeful variety, <laughs> I am though. I'd like to be one. So, and yeah. and and I truly ag agree with the next sentence because it's just so true. And I can feel it physically in me. I can feel it mentally in me. And I'm struggling with this, but. I know that there's a way, a path, a, a a structure that will take me along. So that's all I got. Great. Thank you. And you are in the right place. Uh, the good news is coming up here. <laughs> Regina, come on in and share with us. I just want to see if I have the right um, clarification on the difference between an atheist and agnostic. So an atheist is one who does not believe in God. And an agnostic is one that doesn't have faith even in the idea of a God. According to the definition that I've looked up and, and been learned about, uh, it is a, an atheist is convinced there is no God, period. An agnostic thinks there may be a God, there may not be a God and doesn't really care. It's like, hey, I'm just gonna live my life to the best of my ability. And if there's a God, great. If there's not, that's fine too, whatever. They just don't care. So, so it's like, it's almost so, sounds so crazy. It's like an atheist faith is in no God. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So the, the point is the good news, and, and it worked for me, and by the way, my experience with God now is phenomenal. And it was a result of taking the 12 steps and having an open mind. We're going to learn all about it now in this chapter. This is probably the most important chapter in the entire big book. It not only applies to the spiritual principles, it applies to everything in life about being open-minded and how powerful and effective that is. And that's a key part of these steps working for us, having an open mind and just being willing to try something new, do something different than what you think is right. That's what this chapter is all about. So this is describing me perfectly. The next paragraph, Suzanne, go ahead and read it for us. All right. But it isn't so difficult. About half of our original fellowship were exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope. We were not true alcoholics, but after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Perhaps it is going to be that way with you, but cheer up. Something like half of us thought we were an, um, atheists or agnostics. Our experience shows that you need not be disconcerned. Disconcerted. Okay. So let's stop right there. <clears throat> is there anyone in the room that now feels like, oh, well, okay. Uh, I, I'll go, I'll go along with it. I'll just try it out. What the heck? What have I got to lose? If half the people, 50 of the hundred people that got sober originally were like, I felt like this God thing's a bunch of BS, not interested. And, but they got through. I did. They didn't, I don't need to be disconcerted. It's like, okay, I trust these guys. It worked for them. It'll work for me. I'll just go along with it. Come on in, Lindsay. Hi, good afternoon, Lindsay, grateful recovering alcoholic. I had a huge issue with God. Um, I had negative feelings of anything. If he even existed, I was just not into it. And you know, I was willing to do anything but AA and believe in God to stop my drinking. So funny that um, when I had a huge spiritual awakening, it was actually reading We Agnostics. 
um, that I did have that open mindedness because I thought, okay, if it's working for other people, maybe I should just give it a try. Just be open and just give it a try. And wow, was I ever walled once I actually surrendered and and came to the program and connected with the uh, higher power, which I now call God. Um, it was incredible. But I was in that crowd. We agnostics, I definitely like understood that. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. That is exactly what we're talking about here. It's like, hey, I'll just try it out. And lo and behold, <laughs> God, God, it's a it's a promise. It, it, it happens. It works. It's a miracle. So Okay, so we don't need to be disconcerted if even if right now we're still having an issue with the God thing, don't worry about it. No need to be disconcerted. Just go along with what we're reading, the, the experience that they're describing for us here, the process. So, Suzanne, go ahead and read okay. the next. Year. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could, could will these things, uh, will, we could will these things with all of our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Okay. So this is us trying to live on self-will and self-knowledge and, and, and wish and willpower, and we're going to solve this problem on our own. And it does not work. And not only does it not work, it fails utterly. So that's if that matches your experience, if you have been unable to stop on your own power, then you're in the right place. You're with a, a big group of us that have the same story. Can't stop on our own power. No. Okay, so go ahead and read. Oh, hold on. Oh, we got a hand. Yeah, Mary, you come on in and share with us, Mary. Hi there. My name is Mary, and I am a recovering alcoholic. This is my very first time being on, and I just thought I'd chime in. Um, I I am spiritual but I was still being an alcoholic. So I'm I'm pleased that, that there's that kind of spiritual background to this because I feel like I know it's strong and effective and it'll help get me closer to God again. <clears throat> Great, thanks for sharing with us. We're glad you're here, Mary. Thank you. Okay, so okay. go ahead and read the next All right. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where were we, um, where and how were we to find this power? Okay, let's stop right there. So that's the dilemma. I cannot handle my life on my own power. I'm out of control. I need help. I need something more powerful than myself to help me live my life. I don't have the power to control people, places, and things. I don't have the power to control my drinking, uh, control and enjoy my drinking. I need help. So there, I need a power greater than myself. It says, obviously, and that's true for me. So where and how am I gonna find this power? Where do I find it? Bill's asking a question here. And the good news is, he always gives us the answer. So go ahead and read the answer for us. All Susan. right. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. That means we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, that we are going to talk about God. Here, difficulty arises with agnostics. Many times we talk a new man and watch his hope rise as we discuss his alcoholic problems and explain our fellowship. But his face falls when we speak of spiritual matters, especially when we mention God, for we have reopened a subject which our man thought he had neatly evaded or entirely ignored. Okay, so that's what this book is about. It's going to enable me to find a power greater than myself that'll solve my problem. 
Now, what's my problem? It's like Ray always says, it's life, oh. dealing with life, <laughs> dealing with people, dealing with situations. That's why I drank. I was uncomfortable dealing with life and drinking made me feel better. That was my problem. Life, people, relationships, the way I feel and act and all of that stuff. So there is a solution. It's a power greater than myself that can solve that for me. And then I hear this word God, though. So here it is. Regina, come on in and share with us. Sometimes I hate to see my own hand go up. <laughs> you know what? Um, it talks about morality here, spiritual and moral. And, you know, I don't know how to say this, but without God, without the sunlight of the spirit, I am in a, a, with alcohol or whatever, I am prone to have characteristics that are not um, good. I'll just put it like that, that are not good. And I think that, you know, if I go out here in the street out here and use the bathroom, somebody's going to say something's wrong with me, right? But if a dog goes out there and uses the bathroom out there in the street, they're going to say it's a dog, right? But when I turn my life and my will over to God, it changes my character. He gives me, for me, his character. So for me, man without God is prone to do anything, whether he use alcohol or whatever the, the case may be. And when I turn my life over to God's will and his care, then allowing the, the him to remove those characteristics that are not like him from me, and in place fill me with those characteristics that I think as creator God wanted to be in me from the beginning. But when I drink, I am totally not in characteristic of God and I need a power greater than myself for life, not just to help me overcome the alcohol obsession, but any obsession that will cause me to be separated from God. I tried. I don't know if I made any sense, but in my head, there's something going on up there. Thank you, Regina. So I want to ask the question about the group here. Has anyone, is anyone here right now feeling like, hey, I've got some hope. There's a solution. Uh, this power greater than myself can help me. And uh, but then it says there uh face falls when we speak of spiritual matters and mention God because we've reopened the subject. Is there anyone here that's still feeling like, dang, I wish there was a different way. I don't like this God thing. Does anybody feel that way? Or are we all good with the God thing? Okay, good. That's wonderful news. Okay. But if you did have a problem with the God thing, Suzanne's going to read the next paragraph for us at the bottom of page 45. Go ahead, Suzanne. All right. We know how he feels. We have shared his honest doubt and prejudice. Some of us have been violently anti-religious. To others, the word God brought up a particular idea of him, which someone had tried to impress upon us during childhood. Perhaps we rejected this particular conception because it seemed inadequate. With that rejection, we imagined that we had abandoned the God idea entirely. We were bothered <clears throat> with the thought that faith and dependence upon a power beyond ourselves was somewhat weak, even cowardly. We looked upon this world of wearing individuals, wearing theological systems, and inexplicable calamity with deep skepticism. We looked against at many individuals who claimed to be godly. How could a supreme being have anything to do with it at all? And who could comprehend a supreme being anyhow? In other moments, we found ourselves thinking, when enchanted by our starlit night, who then made all this? There was a feeling of awe and wonder, but it was fleeting and soon lost. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um... Yeah, who, who wants to share on this? Who can relate to this, what he's telling us here, what we just read? 
Come on in, Lindsay, and share with us. Hi, Lindsay, grateful recovering alcoholic. Um, you know, I'm realizing as this chapter is being read to me right now that um, a lot of my concepts and fear of God were about people saying that they were religious and then doing the exact opposite of what was written in the scripture. And I had heard a lot of people, you know, uh, just using verses from the Bible in a way that suited their own needs and their own desires. And for somebody that hadn't had that connection, but it was preached at me and a lot of horrible things happened under the, you know, idea and concept of God. It wasn't until I actually, I needed proof for myself. It wasn't good enough at one point to just say, well, he's there. You got to believe it. Like I wasn't, I wasn't understanding that I wasn't going to deal with that. So what I needed to do, and then I've, I've expressed this before is in the step three um, or yeah, the 12 steps in four hours, I was able to, it just happened to be at that time when I closed my eyes, that I actually felt warm, I felt fully held, I felt like my mind had been quieted. And I said, that's it. Until I actually experienced it myself, there was no God. And I did. And I'm very, very new with it, right? But God is there. And I feel I can even feel it now. I feel shivers as I'm talking about it, right? So nobody can tell me that it's not real now, because I've experienced it. Thanks for letting me share. That's awesome, Lindsay. So uh, what we're hearing here is, you know, th there's some of us that feel like, you know, uh, there's so much calamity and, you know, we're skeptical and there's all these wars and there's been all this negative stuff and how could there be a God? And then on the other hand, this feeling of awe and wonder. And so uh, that's what Lindsay's describing, this feeling of awe and wonder which I happen to have also all the time myself. So anyway, uh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Come on in, Mama Bear. Yeah, um, I agree with all. I, I, I can't stand religion. Um, I've seen it throughout, you know, all the bad stuff people do in the name of uh, Christianity. Um, I shunned it. However, uh, my relationship with my Heavenly Father is different. And um, coming into these groups, I could see him and everyone he, and, and people here. It doesn't matter where you come from in life, but he, I see his presence in each and every single one of you. It doesn't matter what you believe in. It's the higher power that I've learned. Because I... I, I I don't like religion, and I don't like calling myself names, but here and with the Zoo Crew, I've learned to accept, um, uh, just accept things the way they are and um, see his uh, beauty and his creation in all of you. And, and I thank you very much for letting me share peace out. Thank you, Mama Bear, for sharing with us. Thank you. So, yeah, it, we're going to get into this in detail in this chapter. That's what this chapter is all about, about our own conception of God. However limited and inadequate, just the smallest little seed, God will nurture for us and make it grow into this infinite thing that Regina and I get so excited about. Um so, okay, I think that's going to be a good place to break for today because uh, we're getting close to the end of the hour here. But let me just see. Yeah, and, and we'll do a recap um, next week when we pick up here. So we ended up at uh, page 46. 46 yeah, so to 45. End of the first paragraph. We'll start at the second paragraph next week. Yes. Yes, we have agnostic yeah. temperament. Oh, that's a perfect place to start next there week. We go. Yeah. Oh, this has been just. What such... page, Suzanne? I'm sorry. Uh, page we're gonna, we're, we page 46 is where we ended. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. The end of that yes. first complete, the end of that first yes. paragraph, fleeting and soon lost. Oh, okay. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, wow. What a great little meeting well, let me go ahead and finish up our script here and, and and we'll end up breaking and having a little more fellowship afterwards so want to thank you everyone for coming to the cousin jonathan and quite the rocket man big book study 
We meet every Sunday from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern in this room. This podcast will be available by this Friday. You can join us on Telegram for updates. So Big Book page 164 says that our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. So we're going to go ahead and close this meeting with the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll hang around for a little fellowship after that. So who brought us together for this great big book study this afternoon? Our Father, Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy will be done done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our trespasses and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. Good study. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, Clyde. That was excellent. Thank you, Clyde.